Hi, welcome back to Community Matters. I'm Jay Fidel. It's music to our ears. And uh, Dave Moss is music to our ears. He's, he's the executive director of the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra. And that is something, you know, uh, very important now because we're trying to save the world. And Dave is helping us save the world through music. It's really important. Um, so, Dave, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming. Hey, Jay. Thanks so much for having me. Great to see you. So uh, the last iteration, you were in Chicago, uh, taking degrees and uh, studying, playing. You're a musician, aren't you? Ooh, you're a musician. Tell us about that. That's That goes first. That goes first. Yeah, being a musician is uh, first for me, um, mostly because it's, it happened so early in my life. I actually uh, started violin at the age of two, certainly not by choice. Uh, it was uh, passed on to me from my parents and older siblings that were musicians as well. And so that's really been a first language to me. And I, I realized that how privileged I am to have had that experience. And so that's kind of guided me throughout my career, but I, I received uh, performance degrees from Oberlin Conservatory and the Juilliard School, and then had a, about a decade long uh, career in music, doing everything from playing with the Met Orchestra to backing up Kanye West and The Who, um, and then found myself back in Chicago doing an MBA at University of Chicago, uh, running an opera comp company that only did opera from the age of enlightenment. Uh, so a very niche market for that opera company um, and playing in the orchestra for Hamilton in Chicago all at the same time. And, uh, and oh my God, <laughs> it's following me. It's coming to Hawaii, you know, in December here. So. Um, but yeah, really, for me, it's the community that we build around these organizations uh, through music. And I've been with the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra since March 10th of 2020. I know that. Everyone should know that. So when you were in Chicago, did you ever run into Quinn Kelsey? Because Quinn Kel Kelsey is a local boy, went to the Lyric, uh, uh, the Opera Lyric in Chicago. And then from thence, he went to the Met, where he is a fabulous star. And, um, you know, people here love him. My wife said if, I, if she ever disappeared, it's because she ran away with him. Uh. <laughs> I completely understand. You know, I, having heard a number of his performances at Lyric Opera during my time there and actually hearing a performance or two at the Met while visiting, um, just a tremendous artist. And what a representation of uh, the voice, uh, the voice of the Pacific here, uh, and the tremendous young artist programs to develop these young artists here in Hawaii, and just a testament to the local talent that's still here as well. So I, I too might run off with Quinn. <laughs> okay. Now, then what is this about you and 17th century instruments? <clears throat> Catgut, as I recall, um, together with, uh, and here's the big question, together with rye whiskey, and do you pour the whiskey into the uh, viola uh, or on the catgut? Uh, not neither of which, uh, you know, it's uh, I think there's a viola joke in there somewhere. Uh, you know, we, we've done all these tuning ups with Iggy and Dave throughout the pandemic. Iggy being our wonderful concert master at the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra, uh, really a dedicated community member here to the music community and community at large. Um, and that came up quite a bit in conversation. Um, so Baroque music uh, was played on a little bit different instruments. Uh, as concert halls got bigger, we had to ramp up the tension, um, higher tension, more sound, fills a place like the Blaisdell Concert Hall. Um, but I had a particular uh, interest in turning back the clock. Um, and with my previous company, we offered time travel. So we would do a premiere of a work by Murray, a composer who had an opera commissioned by Louis XIV. It was performed at Versailles, and then 300 or so years later was performed in Chicago. And so we could take our audience back in time uh, really, to experience yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, that's great, fabulous. So uh, let's, let's talk about your uh, events these days. Um, let's get people out there. Uh, let's let's put COVID behind us. Um, what 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 events have you got scheduled, and where? And do I have to wear a mask? That those are all excellent questions. I am as eager as you are to put COVID behind us, uh, but to also take all the lessons that we learned as an organization uh, about becoming resilient and how we manage our finances and how we double down on our mission throughout the pandemic 
uh, to really give this community music. We're taking all of those things with us, but we really would like to leave the masks and the, the vaccination checks at the door, if you will. We're not quite there yet. Uh, we've got uh, performances coming up here in the month of April at the Hawaii Theater Center, also in May at the Hawaii Theater Center. And we're following the protocols of the theater to still keep masks on despite the ending restriction this week. Um, and to also still require vaccination or negative test. And with that, you know, we, we had patrons who purchased tickets with the expectation that vaccination would be in place. And we want to honor that commitment because those were the people who first came out and supported us uh, ever since our first live indoor performances back in November. We were one of the first organizations to reopen our doors indoor. We did it about seven days after the mayor gave us the okay. Um, and I'm grateful to Greg Dunn and the team at the Hawaii Theater Center for getting us to that point that weekend. Um, and it's just been a, a, an upward climb ever since. But as we're headed into this next month here, we just came off a great set of performances this past weekend at the Hawaii Theater Center, a Brahms Symphony, uh, a, a wonderful evening of Hawaii calls with Aaron J. Salah, throwback to the, the radio and television show. But looking forward here, our next performances are on Friday evening in April uh, with none other than Robert Casimiro. So this is part of our Hoppe Symphony series, our, our half classical show, uh, where it'll be a little bit of classical music and a whole lot of Hawaiian music. And so Robert has a new album that came out recently and a young composer here, Michael Thomas Fumai, has written arrangements to some of those new works that will be performed by our orchestra with Robert. There will be hula. Um, it'll be a wonderful night uh, at the Hawaii Theater Center. And then on Saturday and Sunday of that weekend, we have two Beethoven piano contributors performed and conducted uh, by Anne-Marie McDermott. And to round out the program, we have a, a premiere of a new work uh, by Lelahua Lanzalotti, uh, Kakamaoli, someone who grew up here in Hawaii, someone who I've known since my college days that recently returned here to Hawaii. Um, we have a new work for the orchestra by her. Ask me my favorite. Your favorite? Ask me my favorite. W what is your favorite? Funny you should ask. <laughs> <laughs> Hawaii Calls. I've always had a thing about uh, Hapahaole music, Hawaii Calls, and it's wonderful that you're doing that. How do you do that with a symphony orchestra? Well, one of the things that makes us unique here in Hawaii is that music, that music of this place. And as an orchestra, we have made an effort over the past two years to think of ourselves as a Pacific centric organization and not necessarily as an American orchestra or at all as a Eurocentric orchestra. And so by leaning into the musical culture of this place, by using local artists, by looking towards the past as well as the future of artists here and developing that talent, um, we're able to put together these programs of the Hapa Symphony. So we kicked off the season in February with uh, the Makaha Sons, which I believe they're celebrating 40 years, um, I mean, four decades of, of music together. Um, and then the program this past weekend was uh, hosted by Aaron J. Salah. We had excerpts of Hilo Hadi and, and, and all of the wonderful cast of characters from Hawaii Calls. We had one of the last living members of the cast join us for the performance. We had a new arrangement of the Hawaii Calls theme by Michael Thomas Fumai. And it was an evening of storytelling, of, of telling you know, this radio show that for decades gave people this taste of what Hawaii was and, and, and enticed them to come to uh, the islands here, we're able to still share that. And there's this renaissance of this throughout the world right now because people haven't been able to visit. And so we're leaning into that and developing that for a wider audience. Um, but then as we go in, Robert Casimiro again next month, and then we'll close that series with uh, none other than Raiatea Helm. Uh, and again, a, a program of, of music, some by the Queen, um, others uh, from, uh, you know, artists like Makaha Sons and tons of great arrangements by Michael Thomas Fumai. But I tell you, we, we have, I don't want to call them a backup band because there's so much more than that, but working with these artists and having 64 of the best classical musicians behind them on stage is like none other experience. And Jeff Peterson, you mentioned Jeff Peterson. 
Yeah, we've worked quite a bit with Jeff Peterson. Jeff uh, has a concerto that was written for uh, steel guitar and the orchestra. Um, he's performed it with the symphony here a few years ago. He just performed it with an orchestra in North Carolina, I believe. And we're also in a conversation with Jeff. He has two wonderful children's albums that he's done with Leah Almanza. And so we're looking to the future of developing young programs for Keiki, for kids uh, to come sing along with the orchestra and start to expose this next generation of of, of future music lovers. And, and with that, I, I have to mention our project that we just launched yesterday. Uh, we are doing Peter and the Wolf. We're doing eight performances uh, during the month of April. Um, you know, the, the Prokofiev piece that has, has enlightened generations of classical music lovers and young kids. And we're going to be doing that in Olelo, Hawaii. So we'll be doing it in Hawaiian and English. And then at the end of April, we'll be doing it in Tahitian as well. And so these are all free concerts. Um, you just sign up on our website to attend. They'll be at Mission Auditorium and they'll be at the Kavaiho Church. So a lot of opportunities to expose everyone, anybody who's interested to classical music at our symphony. And your website is? Our website is myhso.org. Okay, HSO standing for Hawaii Symphony Orchestra. Got it. <laughs> you betcha. <laughs> okay, let's talk more about um, the, um, I guess, the Hawaii theater arrangement. You've, you've fashioned a part, by the way, just, just a digression. Uh, what kind of vitamin pills do you take, Dave? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a lot of coffee. Does that count? <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> okay, moving right along. Um, you have you have fashioned a relationship, a new and more robust relationship with Hawaii Theater. Uh, can you talk about it? Yeah, absolutely. This is a conversation that had been started before my tenure with the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra, and and the credit goes to Michael Titterton, who uh, formerly of HPR and uh, is a, a wonderful board member at the Symphony. Um, he and, and Gregory Dunn, the president and CEO at the Hawaii Theater Center, for a number of years had been talking about what a partnership would look like. Um, you know, it's no secret that uh, some of the challenges that the Symphony has had in the past is due to not having what we call permanent home. Um, we get to use the Blaisdell. Uh, you know, there's other shows, you know, the launch of Broadway in Hawaii that utilize that space. And uh, we weren't able to often get as many weeks, as many weeks we needed to be in the Hawaii, in, in the Blaisdell. And it's also a, a, just a huge space for the number of subscribers and where our audience numbers were at uh, in recent history. And so that kind of directed us towards this opportunity with the Hawaii Theater. Now, the Hawaii Theater is another nonprofit organization. So it's a mission driven organization like the Symphony. It's a little bit different than dealing with a government agency, as you can imagine. Our priorities are more aligned, I would say. And, you know, we both have to operate with both earned and contributed revenue. We, we need donors, we need supporters, but we also need ticket buyers. So one of the, the things that happened as I first got here was the, the merging of our box offices. So, you know, two organizations, similar budget size, we're spending a lot of money to just get tickets into people's hands. You need a database to do that. And so by merging that, it was able to save both of our organizations a considerable amount of money, you know, half a million dollars a year by having these two together. I have employees that work in the box office that can help with Hawaii Theater Center events. And then all of those employees also know our subscribers and our ticket buyers because they're coming to the Hawaii Theater Center, you know, week after week. And so for us, it's, it's about how do we serve our patrons best? And, and that's through... Uh, great customer service. And at some of the other venues in town, um, that's not always the first priority. We know that we want to get you into your first concert. We want to get you back for your second. We want you to become a subscriber. And then we'd love for you to become a donor. And then later in life, be a plan giver because our endowment is one of the things that sustains this organization. And that comes through plan gifts. So that's sort of the patron journey that we talk about. And this partnership with the Hawaii Theater Center has allowed us to foster those personal relationships in a much more meaningful way. So glad you're on the show, Dave. No kidding. So, um, so we talked about uh, Blaisdell. We talked about the Hawaii Theater. Let's talk about the Waikiki Shell. And in that case, you know, there's certain constraints on what kind of you know people can come and and what they can bring with them and what can they do on the grass out there and so forth. And there's, there's also you know a difference in the repertoire. 
the repertoire. Um, between these these three venues, anyway, you you play certain kinds of music in one, certain kinds of music in the other, and certain kind of music in the other. Waikiki Shell is um, sui generis in its own category, and I wonder how you treat that and what the possibilities and limitations are. The possibilities are endless at the Waikiki Shell. Um, I will never forget my first week with the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra. I was uh, meeting some of our council members, and and it was. Uh, Ms. Fuganaga, who said, why don't, why doesn't the symphony use the, the Waikiki shell? And I, I'm looking around the room going, what's the Waikiki shell? No, no one's told me what the Waikiki shell was. But then we had a pandemic and we couldn't be indoors. And we started asking more questions about this Waikiki shell. And there had been a construction project that was happening there uh, to do some infrastructure improvements. And we were able to move in there in May of last year. And we actually did eight weeks of performances last summer. We were the first organization to open shows outdoors, um, obviously to a limited audience at first, but got up to 2,500 people last summer. And it was really the access that we can provide at the Waikiki Shell is unlike any other any other venue here. We can get kids into a lawn that seat 4,000 people and we can provide a much lower ticket price so that families can come. And for us, it was this real sense of place. I was talking to a lot of people that I was meeting my age who had young children and they said, you know, I remember going to the Waikiki Shell with my parents and laying in the lawn and looking up at the stars and listening to the music. I want that for my kids. They, I, they want that for the next generation. And so for us, it was this sense of place which took us back to the Waikiki Shell last summer. And certainly the pandemic helped being outdoors and all. So then with this positive response from last summer, we knew that that needed to be something part of our season going forward. So we head to the Waikiki Shell the last weekend of May and we're opening it with literally rocks. Uh, on Friday evening, we'll be doing the music of Def Leppard, and on Saturday, the music of the Rolling Stones. Um, we have this tremendous, I don't even want to call them a cover band because there's so much more than that, that joins the orchestra. Last year, we did Queen and Led Zeppelin with them. It was the most fun I've had at a symphony in, I'd say, two years, but longer. Um, and it was really, so we have that to kick it off. The next cover week, band. We can... What is the cover band be, uh, with, with an orchestra? How does that work? <laughs> It works great. We have, they again, they have charts that are arranged for the orchestra and for uh, a lead singer who last year, you could not tell the difference between Led Zeppelin and the cover band, he was so good. Um, and it just, it, again, the best backup band in the world. The sounds that our orchestra produces are just phenomenal. Um, and to do it in an outdoor atmosphere where, you know, you can have a beer or two in your hands and uh, enjoy the sunset as it reflects on Diamond Head um, and a real nice evening out. And so as we get into the rest of this Sheraton Starlight series, we'll be doing uh, a program of Hulse the Planets, which what better place than outdoors to listen to Hulse the Planets. And then the following week, uh, Sarah Hicks, a uh, wonderful, phenomenal, internationally recognized conductor and happens to be a Punahou grad, uh, will be returning to conduct Gershwin uh, at the Waikiki Shell. Uh, Gershwin, ask me my favorite, David. Is your favorite Gershwin? Yes. <laughs> and, <laughs> there was a Gershwin concert at the Shell a few years ago that tore my heart out. It was so beautiful. And looking at the stars, it was heaven, you know, because for me and others like me, it's very nostalgic. And Gershwin is really the man for me. <laughs> well, you won't want to miss this then because the, the Gershwin we're doing is the piano concerto in F and we're doing it with this phenomenal pianist, Aaron, Aaron Deal. He just gave a, a performance with uh, Detroit Symphony last weekend that I've been reading some reviews about. That he's a classical pianist, but he's also equally at home as a jazz pianist. He could slip into blue note just as easily he could slip in in front of an orchestra. And the wow factor of the performances at the Waikiki Shell uh, with, with Aaron and the Skirshwin and Sarah Hicks conducting, it's going to be a memorable night. So let's talk for a moment about the Hawaii Opera Theater. 
Um, my wife and I have followed the Hawaii Opera Theater since uh, God a long time ago. I don't want to mention how long it's been. Um, and, um, you know, uh, we know there's a relationship, a, a critical relationship um, between the, uh, the orchestra and the Hawaii Opera Theater. And uh, you, your fortunes are their fortunes, and their fortunes are your fortunes. Can you talk about that relationship? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I would be happy to. Uh, I, first of all, I, I admire the work that uh, that Andrew Morgan has done during his tenure here. He's came in at a very difficult time, and there was a little bit of synergy between the two of us. He, we actually grew up in Chicago, just about ten minutes from each other. We're both good Midwest boys, um, and you know, he and I recognize that our our futures are tied to each other. We need a world class orchestra here for the world class opera that they're producing. Um, and so we found uh, ways of bringing our, the opera contract back under the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra. So those are our work weeks for our musicians and looking at how we expand that. Um, you know, it's, he is someone that I will pick up the phone when I'm having a hard day and I know he will do the same for me. And it's really that resilience that we've built throughout the pandemic and, and not just Andrew, but uh, Kip Wilborn at the Manoa Valley Theater, Halona at uh, the museum, uh, Kimmy uh, from the new, the new executive director of the ballet. There's this group of us that is really bound together through the experience of the past two years. And it's a rising tide lifts all ships. The more these organizations can support each other and, and foster this relationship here of outstanding uh, classical music, uh, the stronger we're all going to be as an industry. Yeah, well, you know, a state that has great music is a great state. A community that has great music is a great community. It, and it, it, it enters into our lives somehow. You know, go to one concert, Every, every few weeks or every month, and it changes your life. Even the one experience, you know, you, know, you, you sort of learn something at a visceral level. Um, anyway, I wanted to ask you about the union because uh, the relationship of the symphony and the union is also critical. And that's critical derivatively with the, the opera theater as well. Um, and uh, the relationship between the, the symphony and the, the opera with the union has, has been problematic. You, you talked about a, you know, a, a hard times in 2010 when uh, the symphony went bankrupt and all this, and it's because of uh, an argument with the union. Um, and I wonder how you have fashioned that relationship and how well it works and how well it will work going forward. <laughs> We have a, an excellent relationship, working relationship with the union, uh, Jim Moffat and our orchestra committee leaders. Um, we have uh, worked tirelessly throughout the pandemic to, to have their voice in all the conversations and the decisions that have been being made at the organization. Um, I had mentioned before that my background as a musician, um, I, I was a union member in Chicago, was very involved in the union in Chicago, and very much value the support and role that the unions play, both our musicians union and IOTSE play uh, with our symphony. Um, so I, we maintain that relationship going forward here, and I'm, I'm hopeful that it remains a positive one. You know, the conversations that we talk about organizationally is that we're a mission-driven organization and that we're here to serve the community. And so going forward, that's how we work with our unions as well. You know, we are a nonprofit. We have a fiscal responsibility to sustain the work we're doing going forward. That takes me to my next question, actually. <clears throat> How do you support an orchestra? Because everybody knows that uh, the performing arts, the gate does not, you know, provide enough funding to keep it going. You have to have funding from fun, you know, fun, heavy funders, so to speak, and the public too. Um, but you, the gay alone is not enough. So how um, are you doing that? I recall some of the big names who were giving the orchestra lots of money. Uh, are they still around? Are you out looking for new ones? Uh, uh, and how is your outreach? You know, Michael Titterton knows about this. How is your outreach to the general public? I'm trying to get them to make smaller donations and, and keep the orchestra going, whether or not they attend the concerts. That's a great question. And I'm a fundraiser. I, I like going out and making these connections in the community. And we've had a tremendous amount of success, especially in fundraising over the last two years. We've almost doubled the amount of individual donors that we had with the organization prior to the pandemic. 
it was at an organizational low of under 600. And now we're well over 1200 with a few uh, weeks, months left in our fiscal year. And what we talk about, again, organizationally, is that money follows mission. When we're doing good work and we're finding the educational opportunities, when we're finding the outreach opportunities, when we're able to welcome people to the Waikiki shell in large numbers, the more people we serve, the more people that are going to become donors. Absolutely. And so that's very much how we're trying to organizationally build right now. We've had some tremendous uh, large gift support, and our goal is uh, to work to diversify who's giving to the symphony so that relying on those one or two or three families that have been sustaining the symphony for decades now um, are not the sole source of income for the symphony. But uh, the other side of this is that we need to rely more heavily on our earned revenue. We need to be selling more tickets. We need to be looking for the opportunities of doing recording you know, all of the films that are made here in Hawaii, well, we could also be recording the audio uh, here for those films as well. And so I think as we look towards the future, this idea of diversifying where all of our income is coming from, both contributed and earned, is going to lead to a more successful and a more fiscally responsible organization. Well, that, uh, that goes to something that the um, opera has done. They, they have, uh, they've taken video and uh, you can you can um, get on the video and look at the video. It, it doesn't cost very much, and and you can see the opera whether or not the opera is actually performing, uh, sort of on demand. Um, and I suppose, isn't it true, Dave? You could do that with the symphony too. Are you doing that? Yes, we are very much doing that. Uh, during the early months of the pandemic, we were, uh, again, with our partnership with the Hawaii Theater, uh, we weren't having audience, but we did uh, a number of, of live broadcasts with our groups of musicians on the stage of the Hawaii Theater. And that, again, as you mentioned, provides a tremendous amount of access. We were able to be on all the islands without ever leaving Chinatown. And that led to other opportunities. So. We had a program actually just this past uh, December when you know things were opening up and you know people could go to performances. Um, but we ended up doing a filming in partnership with Hawaii News Now at Kawaihao Church and worked with Kimie Minor and uh, Anuhea and the Hawaii Youth Opera Chorus and did a Christmas spectacular, as it was called, uh, hosted by McKenna Maduli. And we were able to get thousands of people across the state through our Hawaii News Now regional broadcast and streaming on demand um, that it would take us weeks of performance at the Bladesdale or at the Waikiki Shell even to get that many people in front of our orchestra. So we'll continue to rely on that going forward. You know, uh, uh, all the rage is these days is learning about Eastern Europe. And one of the things that I love about Eastern Europe is the pop-ups. You'd be walking through a, a 16th century a square somewhere, and all of a sudden there's a, a fellow who takes off his raincoat and he's playing the violin. And then somebody right next to him is playing another instrument. Before you know it, you're in the middle of an orchestra and they're playing and tearing your heart out. Um, and uh, very powerful stuff. Uh, I saw a video recently about a, an Italian grocery store where this happened, and they addressed all the musicians um, in, in, in grocery, grocery outfits, like they were servicing the, the food. <laughs> all of a sudden, they started singing opera. Uh, it was quite remarkable. And the people in the grocery store were just so excited and happy to see this, and you knew that this process you were observing was wedding them we're connecting them forever and ever uh, to that opera, to opera in general, and in this case, uh, to orchestral music. So pop-ups, there was a pop-up downtown maybe three years ago, even way before COVID, uh, that was very popular, but it was, uh, it was, it was, you could see that it was an expensive, um, you know, complex production in front of Bank of Hawaii. Um, do you have any plans to do pop-ups? Because if you do, I mean, surprise pop-ups. If you do, could you let me know where and when? Well, I don't think that would be a surprise, Jay. Um, oh, thank you, thank you. Okay. <laughs> we will. Uh, we will certainly. It's something that we've been talking about, and you know, I think what you're what you're hitting at is um, the experiences outside the concert hall. Um, and I think so much of the younger generation, it's not that they're not interested in classical music, they're not necessarily interested in passive experiences. And so the being surprised and, and experiencing classical music in an unexpected place, 
I think is sort of what the appeal and the draw is. And as you said, we'll, we'll pull people into this work that we're doing. And so, yes, there have been some very creative conversations around our organization uh, about how we leverage that and find those opportunities, not just in Honolulu, but on the windward side, on the west side, on the north shore, um, and on the neighbor islands as well. Um, we've got 84 musicians uh, for us to be able to spread them out and to, again, impact as many people as possible is at the core of what we're doing. You know, if you do tell me, I won't mention a word, but I will be down there with my camera and I will be taking a picture of this for the world to see forever and ever. <laughs> well, that's that's what it takes. And uh, if anyone was at the show this past weekend, there were a few empty seats on Saturday, you know, and I, I came out uh, to, you know, thank our donors, thank our sponsors for the support. Um, and I said, I want everyone to do something for me. I said, take out your phone. I know it's a classical music concert and we, you know, everyone says, put your phone away, and, but I want you to take it out and I'm going to leave the stage because I'd like you to take a picture of this orchestra. And at the end of the night, I want you to send it to two friends, post it on social media. You know, you all in this concert hall and the people in this community that support the symphony are the ones who are our best advocates. So my, my encouragement is to go out there and share the, the good news about what the symphony is doing. We're here to serve this community with music and so appreciate uh, your work, Jay, to, to share that message, pop up or not. So Dave, what about the, the future for the for the kids? I recall there was a, maybe still is a Hawaii Youth Orchestra. Uh, they were brilliant. They were wonderful. Their conductors and organizers were wonderful. I don't know if they still do it uh, or how COVID has affected them, but they are the feeder, you know, um, to future generations of the musicians who populate the orchestra. How are they doing and, and uh, are they available to you? Very much so. I there are a handful of people that I have really come to admire uh, qu very quickly here. And one of them is Randy Wong, who's the president and CEO of the Youth Symphony. Randy's also one of our musicians in the orchestra. Um, Randy is a phenomenal educator, a, a phenomenal musician, um, and someone who is so driven as a community-minded individual. And the work that the Youth Symphony is doing inspires us at week in and week out. And we have had the opportunities, even during the pandemic here, we were able to do a side-by-side -side with some of those musicians for an Ohana holiday concert that we did uh, back in December. Um, and we're, we're starting to sit down and have that conversation about what it looks like next season and how we can do more. Um, we both want to do more because education and these kids are the future of not only uh, our orchestra, but people who support the symphony. Um, many of these kids are gonna go on to be doctors and, and, and nurses and lawyers, and they're gonna be some of the best board members that we can recruit because they've had this experience uh, with classical music. So I can't say enough positive things uh, about Randy and the work that the Youth Symphony is doing. They've got a great board there. Um, and really, yeah, all for the Youth Symphony. Uh, that's great. Great to talk to you. Great to, to hear all the vitality. And it gives me the, the thought that this, that this is part of our reemergence. What you are doing is part of our reemergence from, you know, being under the sheets, under the covers with uh, COVID. And um, that when we come out as we are coming out through your events, um, we will we will feel it. We'll feel the pulse of community. We will feel people coming together again. You know, there is nothing like live music, and it's a sharing experience to the guy next to you. <clears throat> and that's and that's what is going to happen. And listening to you is really a, is invigorating. I just want to ask you, you know, how do you think we we've done today? Because you know, for years and years, Jim Moffat waves to me when I come into the theater and he's very friendly and all that. And I want to know if we did okay, then he will continue to wave to me. If, if, I, if we didn't do so well, he's not going to wave to me anymore. What do you think, Dave? I, I, am, I am confident uh, that Jim will continue to wave uh, to you and to me and uh, will continue that great relationship. Uh, a lot of admiration as well for Jim and the work he's done for this orchestra um, and all of his colleagues on, in the orchestra. Yeah. Okay, your opportunity to leave a message, a takeaway, if you will, 
Uh, let's assume there are, um, oh, roughly 400,000 people out there watching this show. Uh, what, uh, what would you leave with them? I would leave that the importance of art and culture, especially here in Honolulu and in Hawaii, goes far behind, far beyond the the work in the concert hall. Um, and I think we're very fortunate right now to have uh, local administration uh, with the city and county and, and Mayor Rick, and especially with Makanani Salah at the Mayor's Office of Culture and Arts uh, that understand the economic importance of the work we're doing. We're a $2.6 billion industry, the opera, the symphony, all of the live entertainment here, you know, the restaurants, the parking, all of that that supports this industry, that it is, if we learned anything during the pandemic, it's, it's how we as a community need to diversify what we do. And the symphony is doing that in our mission and we'd like to see that in the diversification of our, our local economy here at the state level, at the city level. And so that's one of our big emphasis is right now is that how do we become good neighbors in Chinatown with our partnership at Hawaii Theater? How do we lead to the re-energization of that neighborhood? Also around the Blaisdell and the Waikiki Shell. And when we bring our musicians to the Windward side, who are we partnering with and how? Um, so that's the message that I would leave. It's For me, it's, it's not about Beethoven. It's about building community around this organization, no matter what's being played on stage and doing so in a way that's reflective of this community here in Hawaii. Building community, music is more than music, it's building community. Thank you so much, Dave. Dave Moss, Executive Director of the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jay. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.